So welcome. Many of you are part of the graduate diploma of digital orthodontic treatments, uh, either the Australian version or the UK version. And I want to make sure you can all see this. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. And you can all see the file to download now. Well, we are very delighted to have Dr. Ben Chan, okay? He's been uh, phenomenal in coming forth and doing this presentation for us and involving Dr. Tanya Lee, who's also a dentist, working with Dr. Ben Chan, who's a medical doctor, cosmetic doctor. And um, they're, they're both doing this together and showing some patients to you. So really the highlight of this lecture is fillers, toxins, and facial aesthetics for dental practitioners. It's all about us. And what he's trying to really say is that the demand in toxin and fillers is increasing and the number of dentists performing these injections are also increasing. So this talk is going to address, you know, further support, training, integration of toxin and fillers into your dental practice and beyond. Very, very important questions. Now, this webinar will be placed on our YouTube and also possibly in Dr. Ben Chan's YouTube later on. Make sure you follow YouTube channel. By the way, our subscribers are going up, so we no longer are at 681. Um, I'm a fan of YouTube, so and I keep pumping a lot of videos, a lot of cases there for you all. There's lots of learning, so make sure you go on to the Boss YouTube channel and subscribe. Um, and as you know, we continue to fund and support Smile Train, our favorite charity, through all your enrollments. And so far, we funded over 200 cleft lip and palate surgeries um, in developing countries. COVID has slowed that down a bit for us uh, in terms of the reach to the children, because right now uh, some of the surgeries were canceled. But hopefully, when COVID's um, you know gone or more managed, we'll be able to get more children with free cleft lip and palate surgeries. So part of your course is the first unit, which is about researching evidence-based literature. Then your second unit is about performing orthodontic exams and taking records. Then you are going to you know, also do diagnosing and, and planning treatments, mostly with digital technologies and focus on clear aligners. Then I teach you how to evaluate and use all these different digital technologies during orthodontic treatment and the best protocols for it how to perform early interceptive orthodontics with clear aligners um, and how to then monitor your treatments, how to not just start, but also monitor them throughout till the finish line. And lastly, one of the most um, important unit is how to use a multidisciplinary approach in orthodontic practice. Now, this is where this comes in. You know, all we think about is moving teeth, but we forget about the effect of soft tissue. We forget about uh, the mobility, the tonicity of the facial musculature, because we become so focused on dental occlusion and the patients focus on smile and facial aesthetics. So I think this is where we need to learn from Dr. Ben Chan and Dr. Tanya Lee how we can incorporate this multidisciplinary approach in our smile designs. So without further ado, I'm gonna get Dr. Ben Chan and Dr. Tanya to talk about themselves and share their screens. Um, if you have any questions, text us, email us, website us, YouTube us, Instagram us, Facebook us, <laughs> anything. You know, I love social media. And, um, you know, uh, I'll also have a poll very soon uh, during the presentation. So make sure you're very interactive and ask all the questions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ben. Hi, good evening, dentists. <laughs> uh, today's topic to me is a very exciting topic for dentists. Um, because this is sort of an um, expanding area and, and you, I'm sure you'll find it refreshing. I don't, I don't talk about teeth and I know nothing about teeth. And uh, so the first thing I want to introduce to you to is myself. I'm, I'm a medical doctor. I'm the director of Aesthetics and Skin Institute. And I'm an owner of a number of cosmetic clinics and a fellow of ACAM and retired fellow of the CPCA and other aesthetic medicine. And also I was on the board member of ACAM. And uh, so th I have 30 years of experience in aesthetics. And what is ASI? That's the banner I'm working under. Uh, that's Aesthetic Skin Institute. So we provide training uh, in the field of aesthetics to uh, doctors, nurses, therapists, and dentists. And it is uh, important that each of us work within uh, the scope and also the training. We primarily focus on non-invasive treatments to the face. 
a lot of people, when they hear about aesthetics, I'm not talking about dentists now, I'm talking mainly about doctors and nurses, they don't understand that there are actually two streams. One is the injection stream and the other one is a skin stream. Uh, injection stream is what we talk about today, which is toxins and fillers. And the skin stream has to do with uh, lasers and cosmic dermatology and so on. And of course, there's a third uh, sort of spring off is the uh, PRP, PRF, threads, lipo dissolve, laser training, and so on. So we do provide online courses and hands-on training. So let's talk about the aesthetic market. So the aesthetic market is an anti-aging market, is cosmetic products and procedures. It is on the rise, and um, there's a snapshot of this, um, of this from the Google. We show that the forecast is forever increasing anyhow. And uh, toxins and fillers are, of course, on the rise. Um, there are many reasons for it. More disposable income, and patients want to look younger or maintain their youth or anti-aging. And there's a lot of social media influence. So everybody wants to look good, regardless of who they are. They all want to look good, and they all want to look younger. And if you look at the business at itself, the aesthetic business, injections is a big proportion of the revenue of laser and cosmetic clinics. And if you look at the table on the right-hand side, of course, uh, in the Western world, USA is by far the one uh, that is dry, that is the biggest consumer in that area in the, as a block. And of course, Asia Pacific area in the Southeast Asia and, uh, and the subcontinent. And this is on the rise because it is more disposable income. So it's, this is not new to anyone who is in this. And that's why there's proliferation of so many cosmetic clinics uh, there. And if you look at facial, dental facial aesthetics, we also know that um, besides being in demand for the fillers and toxins and the number of dentists performing these are also increasing and the number of dentists that we train are also increasing. If you just Google around your area, you find that um, look, there are, there are quite a number of dentists and, and uh, performing these things. You just have to Google uh, dentists performing Botox or toxin or fillers and you will show up in your area. So it may be quiet, but it is certainly uh, a workforce that is coming up. So the, the areas we talk about today is um, somehow I, um, did we talk about is the, the two main areas. Um, which is the, uh, I somehow missed the topics for the slide. Somehow just skip this. So we talk about the cosmetic, uh, the aesthetics market. So we're going to talk about what is toxin, what are fillers, and how is it relevant to dental facial aesthetics. And we talk a little bit about uh, training. And there's a snippet about uh, beyond dentistry and introduction on how to incorporate this into your skin clinic or your business in your clinic. And Dr. Tanya Lee will talk about incorporation of cosmetic injections into dentistry and the scope within, um, uh, within your practice. So the first item we talk about is botulinum toxin. So we call it Botox by name. And in Australia, there are three brands. There's Botox, there's Zoomin, and there's Dispot. How does it work? Well, it basically blocks at the the release of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. So by blocking this, it, it actually stops the contraction at that injection point. It's very important when you say that it's at the injection point. So if you inject there, it doesn't spread everywhere. It's just localized at the injection point. So it's only effective at that point of injection. When it first started by the Dr. Carruthers, a husband and wife team, but Canadians, they, uh, I think the wife was a dermatologist and the husband was a pharmacologist. That's how they discovered uh, using uh, botulinum toxin in strabismus. Um, since then, um, the whole idea about using toxin has skyrocketed in medical use, in aesthetic use, and you see in dental use in a minute. Uh, in migraines, of course, hyperhidrosis and spasticity. This is commonly used in hospitals. Um, bruxism is where the dentists come in. And, uh, and then, of course, there is the aesthetics clinic. So in aesthetic use, uh, for those who are used new to uh, botulinum toxin or Botox, which is the brand, which I tend not to say, I'll just say botulinum toxin. 
It is of course anti-wrinkle and anti-aging. Predominantly, most of these are in the glabella area, um, the frown lines, the periorbital, the, um, uh, the wrinkles on the sides of the eyes, and the frontalis, the frown lines. And of course, it's also used in the neck bands and jawline, we'll go into that, and the nephrotity lift. And of course, in the related to the dental aesthetics is the downturn mouth, the DAO, depresso angularis oculi, uh, oris, uh, the gummy smile, LSAN, uh, levator labii superioris eloquent nasalis, I'll just say LSAN, and facial slimming, which is a big part, uh, which is a masseter and also treatment of bruxism and TMJ. You know that area better than me. So let's cover the common aesthetic areas that you see people walking to shopping centers and so on. Uh, what do they ask for? Well, they ask for anti-wrinkles and on the left-hand side, these are the frown lines. Uh, so we target the frontalis. Um, it is not, you just can't shoot everywhere. You just can't inject every part of the frontalis, otherwise you get a brow drop. Uh, so there are certain formulation and how you inject, where you inject, how deep you inject. So this is one of the three commonest um, uh, required areas, and of course, the uh, site of the, uh, the eyes, the uh, periorbital uh, smiles, and so people don't like to show those wrinkles when they smile. Uh, we target a portion, the lateral portion of the opicularis oculi. And then, of course, the frown lines, they get deeper as we get older. The uh, corrugator and the procerus muscle just hypertrophy as we uh, get older. So these frown lines, and sometimes you get very deep and uh, very deep frown lines that we inject. So what can I say about these areas other than being the most common uh, aesthetic areas that we inject? Uh, these are very quick um, injections, and very, um, not almost no side effects. Well, there are side effects, but they all disappear after about three months. Uh, there's a brow drop or ptosis. Uh, they all disappear within three month periods, all right? Um, in general, um, these are like walk-in, walk-outs. That's why you see proliferation of these clinics in, uh, in the shopping centers. And uh, you may even have had patients asking you, uh, doctor, do you, uh, dentist, do you, do you inject these areas because they are there already anyway? Um, so it's a three monthly injection. They don't last more than three months in general. And um, they, of course, uh, if they have less units and it can last less of a, uh, less period, but in general, these injections are repeated every three months. And these are these three areas are uh, very high in demand. So what about relevance to dental facial aesthetics? As you can see on the chart on the right, these are the muscles of the face, facial muscles that we target them. But the bottom part are the ones directly related to dentists. Um, you probably see more of these than us because we're so busy injecting the upper areas. Uh, a lot of us actually uh, forget to look, assess the uh, bottom part of the face because uh, this is not what we're training. We look at the upper part of the face and, and we inject there, but the bottom part of the face is relevant to uh, the dentist area. And before we go into uh, those dental areas, we, we talk about the biggest area that we see um, in terms of toxin to the masseter. So the dentist it is a functional thing. Uh, it's a medical application, which is for bruxism or the TMJ. And then they may get high migraine, they may inject the temporalis as well. But in general, for bruxism, we're not going to talk about the temporalis here. We just talk about the masseter injection. Um, there, there are two indications. One is for facial slimming, and, uh, and the other one is for bruxism, which is your, your biting, your grinding. And in terms of slimming, it is definitely a lot more demand in Asians. In Asia, uh, in Korea, we started all this. Uh, look, this is almost injected daily. You know, there's a con going clientele who require this of infections, uh, injections because we, in Asia, like me, you can look at my face, you got rounded, but they all like to have a slim face, especially in younger, younger girls. But in the Caucasian market, it's also slipping in and you will see a picture later on. What can I tell you about masseter injections? These are very simple injections and it's two or three injections, almost painless. Um, 
the markings are easy, the injection technique is easy, there's, there's nothing technic too technical about it, it's got to do with the depth, you've got to hit the bone, and um, you've got to don't inject too far forward, otherwise you'll you go into the rhizorus muscle, if you go too high, uh, you go into the parotid, well, you can't, uh, you don't get any side effects from injecting parotid, they do string, but then you're not going to get as much effect. Basically, as you know, the bulk, when you start looking at aesthetics, basically the bulk of the masseter muscles is in the inferior part rather than the superior part. So nothing much can go wrong injecting this other than not injecting too anterior into the rhizorus muscle. So facial slimming, as you can see, it does make a lot of difference uh, if you can identify those patients, which is a bit of a, we call them square jaw, but you can see this lady is not really exactly a square jaw. It's just a very prominent um, masseter muscle. Uh, you will begin to start looking at your patients from tomorrow, I bet, and you will quickly identify a lot of your clients actually have that, uh, have that uh, requirement. It is not because... Uh, is not happening out there is because you dentists actually have a captured audience of these people who require um, masseter uh, injections. That's from an aesthetic point of view. But from a grinding point of view, I can't tell you the incidence of people who grind and I'm one of the grinders and um, you know I wear plates and so on. So it is, it is a, a fair bit of a requirement. Uh, we get frequently asked for them for grinding. Uh, when we do facial streaming, we always say, do you grind uh, as well? If they don't grind, if they're just facial slimming, you are talking about 50 to 80 Botox units. I'll say Botox units. And if the teeth grinding, I know uh, some of my dental uh, practitioners, they inject 60 to 100 units. And of course, I don't know whether you can measure grinding, whether they come back, but in facial slimming, we can see, okay, the slimming effect is disappearing. We may do it in six months and we do less. Um, in terms of comparison to anti-wrinkle injection, uh, the grinding, teeth grinding uh, injection is actually very less, a lot less risk, a lot less needles and less dissatisfaction because they all work. Um, uh, rather than having this Botox unit on the, on the side of the uh, eyes, they say, oh, no, I don't have enough, I, I need it higher and so on. There is no such adjustments in uh, masseter injections. And we are beginning to see less dental referrals now because more and more dentists are injecting. In general, anti-wrinkle injections last about three months. So yes, they have to come back again in three months. Um, and it's also a less dose compared to masseter because each visit is usually only 10 to 50 units compared to uh, teeth grinding, which is 60 to 100 units. Uh, if you ask me from business point of view, I'd rather do teeth grinding every day because <laughs> it is just, uh, just uh, two injections and I can hit the rest, uh, you know, less trouble because it only takes me two minutes just to inject anyway. And the thing is that masseter injections last six to nine months. It may be because um, this is injected very deep into, deep into the uh, masseter muscle, whereas the anti-wrinkle injections uh, especially on the periorbital areas. They are just um, the peri, uh, the per orbicularis oculi muscles. They are just attached to the skin. So it's very superficial. So the doses are really small. And because there's a lot of movement in that area, um, these injections don't generally last as long as facial slimming or bruxism. Um, can I ask a question, Dr. Ben Chan, just on that slide? We've got a dentist, Laura, saying, are these doses that you're mentioning, are they per side or in total? Uh, in total, per side. Uh, if we talk about uh, grinding, it's about 30 to 50 units per side. In total will be about uh, 60 to 100 units. Perfect, thank uh, you. In total. Thank you. So uh, if those who are, who are cost conscious, uh, should I talk about money? <laughs> <laughs> the Botox units, if you use Botox, is approximately $5, $6 per unit. And the charge is approximately $100, um, sorry, $10, $10 per unit. Um, if you inject somebody 50 units, uh, for example, it's $500, and you can work out your own margin there. Um, if you use this spot or zoom in, they are a lot cheaper. Uh, they're probably half the price and you still charge the same. So the margin goes up a lot. So uh, that's, the, um, that's the aesthetic market of it. 
So uh, the other areas that are, so the big area is the, uh, is the masseter area. So I bet you see a lot of gummy smile. We, we, we just can't in aesthetic clinic, we can't get them to say, hey, you need your, 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 uh, your smile uh, corrected because uh, we have so often offended patients when they didn't come in for their smile and their teeth and we mentioned to them that we can do this. Uh, they say we didn't come in for it. So we actually don't have that captured audience there that we can sort of introduce this to them and they do get offended when we tell them that. So you are in the perfect position to explain that, oh, do you know you have a treatment for this? You don't have to show so many teeth. I don't know whether it's good or bad to show so, show so many teeth. Unfortunately, it's a small dose injection. It's only about two, two to three units each side. Uh, so there's not a lot of, it's a lot of time for a little thing, but it works so well, it's very highly effective and almost no complication if you know exactly where to inject the LLSAN. It's just two very simple injections. Yes, they last about three months. Uh, average dose, both sides is uh, four units, but of course, if you've got a bigger face, you'll be uh, four to eight units. So you just up the dose. Um, what happens if after inject, well, they don't raise so much. Uh, but you may end up with a, if you inject too much, you may end up with a very sheepish uh, sort of smile. Um, but that is, you, you just titrate the dose. Usually about um, two or three units each side is enough to start off, and then you increase the dose. If you inject too much, they just smile a little bit, a uh, sheepish smile. They can't sort of open the smile wide. Um, you know, in dentistry, there's such a thing as a vertical smile and a horizontal smile. I don't need to... Uh, uh, it, when it comes to training, then we'll, we'll go into details. And cobblestone. Now, I bet a lot of your friends will have cobblestone. Some are bothered by it. Some are not bothered by it. Uh, this is a cobblestone smile. Uh, yes, this one, we do, we do take note of them when they come in for a total uh, toxin assessment. So we do look at every single part that we can inject. And then we look at this particular area. And if you inject those areas, um, then they, again, it's a very simple injection. A dose is probably four to six units in total. It could be one injection point if they've got a small chin or two points, which is one centimeter or one finger's breadth apart. And it lasts three months. It works beautifully. Uh, you're hitting the mentalis muscle. It is low risk and fairly easy injection. Smokers line, yes, we get uh, we get patients who want it, and of course the fillers we talk about later on. Um, the perioral smokers lines, um, it is injecting the upper part of the uh, of the calaris oris. Um, the downside about it is that it's slightly painful. It's only a very small unit, four you four injection points upper, four injection points lower, and each injection point is only one unit of toxin. So it's a lot of work um, for about eight units. And the patients that we don't inject are the ones who need to blow a, a musical instrument or want to sing, and it may impair their movement if they want to suck a straw. But they still can still suck a straw, but not as, as efficiently. I don't know how many people suck straws nowadays, but uh, you basically have to uh, warn if they're musicians, uh, that's a no. And uh, those who blow trumpet or flute or something like that, because they will make it hard to, to do that. Again, um, you are injecting in the vermilion border, so it is very sensitive and is about two millimeters in. It is highly effective, but it is not, as you know, that part of the skin is quite tender and it are just very small injections and it works uh, within days. It works very well. Uh, the depressed angle of the mouth. Again, I bet you see these patients all the time. We, we, um, when they come to us with perioral areas, it is difficult because we know that a lot of problems are, are part of the dentition. And, uh, but they do have this downturn mouth, which is due to the depressor angularis of oris muscle. They get a set look. And uh, to inject that area is not too difficult. Uh, is only two units each side. It's a very quick, simple procedure, not that painful. You just grab the DAO and you inject away. There's not no side effects if you in if you are taught to inject and aim at the muscle. 
uh, properly and, and not the uh, depressor uh, oris muscle. So you just got to be very accurate when you inject. But again, I haven't seen many complications with that. Uh, one of my job is to monitor complications from, from injectors Australia-wide, but I haven't seen anybody having that. But again, if it injects or what, it disappears within three months anyway. So it's, it's a very little uh, risk injecting that. The neck line and the jaw line um, is uh, what we do with a, with a lifting of the jaw line. As we, as we get older, we get a sagging jaw, and part of it is due to hypertrophy of the, of the um, platysmal muscle. Um, I don't know whether you can inject the neck. We, so we certainly do. We inject the platysmal, the neck bends all the way down, and we type, we sort of inject at the jawline where the platysmal muscle meets the uh, upper part of the face, and, and so there's no downward pull. So that's what they call the Nefertiti lift. And to inject the, all the neck lines is like one centimeter apart all the way down, all, all those neck bends that you can see on this patient's left hand side especially uh, is one centimeter apart tracing all the way up there so it's quite a lot of units a lot, lot of injections uh, each injection is only one centimeter apart and each one is almost subdermal injection so they're pretty quick injection but just um, they, you never get the perfect um, completely gone you all bring them back again and you touch up those areas that they're concerned about because when one, one band goes away, they notice another band. So you just got to touch it up and, and continue until the patient is satisfied. So in summary, injecting toxin. Toxin injection is really uh, a, quite a simple, even for us to train. Uh, the technique uh, is to do with how deep in the muscles you go. Uh, technique of injection is important. It is easy to learn. They are fairly low risk. Uh, treatment and high reward, not in terms of financial, but also patient satisfaction, especially in the grinding and in the bruxism area, you can actually see the slimming effect. And I'm not sure if the dentists, when they do the grinding, they actually take photographs. Uh, whereas when you do face slimming, we definitely take photographs because we want to see whether that degree of slimming meets their expectation. But I guess you, uh, if you're just doing for bruxism, uh, you may not need to take this sort of uh, photos. So, no questions? Any questions? Let me just see. No, no, guys, any questions? There is one actually. Where do you inject for eye twitching? That's Dr. Amrindra Obroy. <laughs> Uh, I don't know why he's asking I, that. I, I, think that's a, I think that's a neurological question. We don't do it because we are <laughs> in aesthetic. So I send them there to you the go. neurologist. <laughs> I think we, we, we don't do migraine. We don't do spasticity. We focus on aesthetics at the moment. Yeah. Um, if there's anything related to the eye, we'll send them to the, to the yeah. eye specialist. We have another excellent question from Dr. Cassandra Wee. She works in the North Shore. And she's asking, is it possible for it to not work in the masseters? Very good question, because just before the lockdown and we think the social media is complaining that uh, the certain, certain uh, people have been using Botox and it hasn't worked. Um, we in our clinic have seen about three cases over the past 12 months. And when we inject um, Botox as a brand, it didn't work, this is the anti-wrinkle. Uh, actually, one was a masseter, and there was no evidence uh, it didn't work. So in the previous patients, we switched to another brand, to this spot, and then switched to Zoomin. In the literature, we definitely see some resistance coming in, so much so that in, when we lockdown is over, we actually get them to write down to sign the consent that if the medicine doesn't work for them, then they have to know that it's not our responsibility because we, you know, we prescribe something and then if it doesn't work, then, um, then it's not our problem. But we see, see this um, sort of resistance coming in. Uh, have I seen one myself over 15, 20 years of injections? No, uh, not to masseter, sorry. To, to the uh, other frown areas we see, I've only encountered two patients in 15 to 20 years, but we are, we are seeing in social media and the nursing group and doctors group, he is seeing a bit more resistance to say, this doesn't work, that doesn't work, that doesn't work. So we are writing out to say, look, you need to sign consent. This is medicine. Um, we can't guarantee it's going to work. Um, 
you know. So in terms of bruxism, I don't know how you can measure it, but in terms of facial slimming, we can definitely say, yes, it didn't work at all, did it? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Okay, and we still we still have a couple more questions. Actually, they're coming now. <laughs> Actually, quite a few. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Hi, Dr. Ben. Any preference on brand or product? Botox versus Dysport. I think you just mentioned that. Um, I, I will mention it because there are two uh, things I need to say because there are some patients that come in and they want Botox. They don't want anything else. They want Botox. And um, so in some clinics, they charge more for Botox. Uh, Fifteen dollars a unit because Botox hasn't dropped in price. The others have. Uh, I think. Don't quote me, yeah, because I don't order this stuff. I think it's about five fifty to six dollars for Botox. Whereas Zeomin is about three dollars, half the price. Um, but in terms of injections, uh, practically speaking, no one has actually said I want this. Uh, I, uh, you know, that you do this, therefore it's cheaper. Is uh, uh, many clinics are like mine. Uh, if they want Botox, we charge fifteen dollars a unit. The others we charge ten dollars a unit. Uh, in duration, look, there's been an ongoing argument whether this is better, that one longer lasting. I, practically speaking, I can only tell you practically speaking, and if a lot of the literature has shown that there is no difference. But when you order Botox, to come and show you, no, this are evidence is better and all that. So I leave you to deal with that. Yeah. We have a lot more questions. So I don't know if you want to keep going. Yeah, keep going because I'm, I, I don't have much to say. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the, so the, keep going good. with the questions, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. So we have another question from Matthew Cohen, Dr. Matthew, and he's saying, are we able to use these products, these procedures within our scope of practice in Australia? Definitely, yes. Dr. Tanya will answer that question as well later on. Okay. Now, um, Dr. Rita is saying, is it common to inject temporalis muscles along with the masseters in grinding patients? Okay. I won't quote the, the super specialist, dental super specialist. He... Um, he injects a grinding, as you know, the temporalis muscle is part of the musculature, whatever, the, the bite, the grinding process. Uh, if, they get, if they get a migraine or headache, a TMJ problem, you know, you get to go up there. Yeah, it's fine. It's quite easy to inject. And the, the temporalis muscle is quite big. There is no um, uh, specific danger there. We just need to help to identify uh, which part of the temporalis muscle is there. It, as you know, the skin layer, the fat layer, the temporalis muscle, and then the bone, that's it. And what you have to avoid is the, the artery. We teach you how to identify the external, uh, sorry, the uh, temporal artery, that's all. Okay. I think dentists okay. tend to inject the temporalis muscle more than the cosmetic. Cosmetic, we don't. We just inject the muscle. Okay. Um, and then Radhika, Dr. Radhika is asking, what is the conversion from Botox units to Xeomin or Dysport? Um, okay, we will definitely teach you that during the course. Um, Xeomin and Botox is one-to-one -one, and conversion to Dysport is one unit of Botox to 2.5 units of Dysport. Uh, having said that, uh, the needle is different so and uh, the training is different. So Dysport and and uh, if I say 2.5 units of this spot is equivalent to one unit of Xeomin and one unit of Botox. But in terms of price, the 2.5 is equal to one unit of Xeomin is about $3. So those two are cheaper. Okay, thank you. And how many units on temporalis for excessive brux bruxism? I think you, oh, that's for the temporalis, yeah. Uh, temporalis, okay, so I have seen... We, in general, we do not encourage you to inject more than 100 units uh, in one, one, uh, one session because, um, look, I've had more than that in my training and the patient will go back with a headache. So <laughs> you're trying to fix a headache, you got to give them a headache. Uh, so you can spread it out, like, for example, 30, 30, 20 up there. So that will give you 100 or 40, 40, 10, 10. If you've got two, two temporalis points, you need to give each point about five to 10 units. So you can just work it out. And uh, bottom, you can just spread the rest of the bottom. I definitely have seen these dental specialists that inject 100 units and no less for TMJ problem. No less, come in one bottle, that's it. Uh, one bottle of uh, Zoomin or Botox or whatever equivalent. Uh, they, they just say 100 units uh, and then they just spread it. Is the resistance to Botox appearing in repeat patients who have had it a few times? Good question. No studies are talking about that yet. 
Oh, great. We just don't know it's, it's sporadic. And the theory is that somebody may develop antibodies towards this uh, medicine. So uh, the jury is out there regarding that. It does. But what have the, ha has happened in Korean uh, textbooks, uh, they're talking about four or five years ago now, journal, that shows that the masseter muscle actually slims almost permanently. And so they get, instead of lasting nine months for facial slimming, and it got longer and longer. Don't forget, the facial slimming is a big trend in Asia, right? It's a big trend in, in Korea, the move to China, it's a big trend everywhere. So we see, uh, we inject these Chinese girls so much uh, on slimming, every time income is slimming. And that's my dream job because I don't have to do anything else in a quick. Um, in terms of the, there's only one study which I published in my Facebook, dental Facebook group as well. Uh, there's only one which is, I wouldn't, I wouldn't count too much on it, that show that there is certain degree of bone resorption in that area. But that is the first study ever, um, but it's not substantiated yet. So, but in terms of aesthetics, uh, in fact, that's what the Koreans want. They want some slimmer jawbone. Uh, so, but whether it leads to anything else, uh, we don't know. But don't forget, Botox has been introduced since the late 80s. It's not something that happened the last five years. So it's been, it's been gone 30, 40 years already. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. You're so knowledgeable about this area. Obviously, you're teaching this area. Um, I have another question. Can you please explain in more details the platysma injections, contraindications, side effects? both that? Sure. Let me see whether I can go back to this one. Yeah. So you can see this lady, I'm talking about this lady's left side. You can see these two platysmal muscles just pulling down. Okay. And so in the front part, she's got this blended area, the two bands coming in, very thick band on the anterior left side. And she's got two side bands on the lateral part of the neck. So if I were to track, train her, there are four main bands, but the right anterior band is not so obvious. So I will target the, uh, the submental area, the two big areas. You can see the bands just blended together. So I will treat those as separate band and just one band uh, at a time. So I will treat three, three and a half bands and I'll use my finger uh, one centimeter breath uh, down all the way to the neckline. Um, so that will be one centimeter apart, one unit per injection. So a left anterior band will lead, need about 10 units, uh, 10 points. So are the lateral bands. The front here will be about five units. So she will need about 35 units. Uh, there. That's how we work it out. So when I, when I do this, next time when I see her in two weeks, she will show some other bands, uh, then we'll tackle that. And along her jawline, where we can't see her side, and I'll sh I'm sure there'll be a pool. I will then do uh, four units along the neck, the jawline, uh, one centimeter apart. So that will give her the Nefertiti lift. Uh, in terms of risk, uh, zero. Uh, it, the only thing is that they say, oh, it may not work as well. They just need more units. That's in the consent. So uh, there is no complication because these injections are subdermal because the platysma is part of the facial, superficial temporal, uh, superficial fascia that goes up. Uh, so uh, it's just skin deep, basically just skin deep. Yeah, not going deep. So okay. there is almost no risk. Okay. Uh, risk of bruising, yes, pain, yes, but no, no, no uh, other complications that we know of. Okay. And I think Dr. Tanya is typing an answer for someone. I'll leave that question. Claudia, Dr. Claudia is asking, when you use this type of treatment every three months, would it damage the muscle over time as you use more units over time as well? Uh, the more units over time is, um, is to, do with the, uh, to do with the area like uh, opicularis oculi, and they, they just expand the more area. So like I said, it's been 30, 40 years of experience. There hasn't been any adverse effect regarding long-term side effects of Botox. But of course, now and then you will get someone like today, I saw a media in Mirror uh, newspaper in the uh, UK, right? They say, oh, Botox caused one in 10 uh, complications. Not, that's not according to our medical journals. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we look at journals all the time. Uh, reporting any side effects or any complications. Uh, if you follow my Facebook, anything else is up there, loaded up there. So we, we scout around for all the, all the journals update. Um, yes. So we don't, we just increasing it. In fact, why do people think that they need to have more and more Botox? Let's talk about the frown line. 
that's the corrugator and the procedures, right? You, if you want to see someone uh, Mediterranean, these muscles are really thick. The, the Greek and the Italians, these, these two muscles are really thick and they really bulge out. And these are the two muscles uh, in, as we age, they really hypertrophy. Uh, well, it's, it's nothing to do with the both of it's just the muscles just hypertrophy. And they get these deep creases. So there was a time about 10 years ago, I said, look, should we start Botox early as early 18? You know, that time was unheard of. Why would you Botox somebody at 18? But now we have patients who come in 21 and, you know, I've only seen one or two at 18 and say, are you sure you want this? Um, so now the, the media, social media is behave, be, um, making them believe that maybe if they can stop squinting all this time, then those permanent lines may not appear. There is some logic to it um, because after all, uh, the muscles hypertrophy and then the skin here is very really thick. If you keep bending your wrist all the time, you don't get the crease here. So there is a bit of logic in there, but is there any, um, uh, is there any journals regarding this? No, it, the, the ages are getting younger and younger. So um, definitely if you keep injecting the front line, you, you definitely won't see that hypertrophy. And I, I personally, personally believe that uh, those those flying lines are not going to appear as quick. It may, it may still be there eventually, but uh, but I haven't seen any patient that that uh, really stick to my three month injections. Okay, great. I have so many questions coming. It's coming. It's coming. Now we're, we're starting to talk about. Uh, there's a few questions in a group that are talking about scope of a dentist, as well as do they need extra insurance and what is in their scope. Uh, Dr. Tanya will address that. Okay, so should we do that more at the end or does she want to yes. address that now? Regarding the scope insur insurance, you definitely covered. Uh, I've, uh, I'll let Tanya explain uh, that, how okay. she gets around it. Uh, yeah. Okay, so also we've got some more questions. Uh, I've seen complications of lip blow-ups. How frequent is that? How do you manage that? Uh, lip blow-ups with toxin? No. Probably fillers. Uh, we'll address that next. Yeah. Uh, and then have you had any experience with patients with Bell's palsy? No, it shouldn't get Bell's palsy from, uh, from toxin to that area because the Bell's palsy, it, by te technically speaking, is the seventh nerve that's being affected as it leaves the skull. There's the inflammation at the orifice. So uh, that's inflammation affecting the seventh nerve, the motor nerve. So um, toxin has nothing to do with it. It's far away from the anatomy anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's continue on because the questions will keep coming. This is so interesting. Thank you, Dr. Ben. It's so I, I, I love teaching too, so. I okay. can tell. Let's go on, <laughs> so, we need to learn more. I don't wanna stop you because there's so much information you have. So guys, keep the questions coming. We'll try our best to answer everything. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Dermophilus, this is such an exciting area, honestly. This certain exciting area. So for those people who don't know anything about dermophilus, um, then here it is. So dermophilus by and large are grouped into two groups. We are not going to talk about the permanent fillers that we are no longer able to inject, right? So we, we leave that alone, the permanent fillers. Um, uh, they no longer exist in Australia, although there is one tiny one which is called, uh, we're just appearing in uh, in America, that's for treatment of acne. So we won't talk about that. We talk about what is in Australia. So dermophilus by and large, when we talk about are hyaluronic acid fillers or HA fillers. And then, then there is a, what we call a skin booster. These are injected subdermally uh, for the skin. And then there's a group called collagen stimulation fillers. So by and large, most people are only exposed to HA fillers, the number one there. We'll, we'll save the collagen fillers at another time. So there are many brands. I've just showcased here, uh, just two brands. There are about five or six brands, right? So the, the company is there. But most of it is the volumization of uh, fillers that we talk about, the HA fillers. I'll briefly mention about the skin booster fillers. We won't talk about the collagen stimulation fillers. So when you have a look at this patient, um, everyone, wants a, a younger look. So look, she wouldn't have had one filler. I, this is from the Gaudemo website. She would have a bit of thick cheap filler. You can see the cheeks plumbed up. You can see the tear trough gone. You can see the nasolabial fold gone. 
you can see her lips volumized, the perioral, the nasal labial, and also the uh, marionette lines on. Um, and her, she's got a nice contour. I bet the temple has been filmed and also the side of the face. So this is a, a total makeup, is, um, is a soft makeup. And to do something like that, um, they, of course, they will have used a HA filler. So what does it tell us that it enhances the beauty of someone, right? It enhances, you've got a higher bone and a bigger lips. So that's what we are trying to achieve in all this time. Some, you can, some people say, ah, oh, it's a waste of money. Well, I leave that judgment to someone else, but I'm here to talk about the technicality of what fillers can do. So HA fillers are hyaluronic acid. This is found naturally in our body. And a lot of the components also found in the skin. And if it is in the skin, remember, come back to this slide, number two, I talk about the skin booster. So the hyaluronic acid, appears in the epidermis and the dermis as this is the molecule that is responsible for the hydration or moisturizing of our skin. So if we want to do that, then we use a very small particle of HA, they're no longer considered as filler because they are injected very superficial onto the skin to keep the skin hydrated. You can't help it with aging, HA disappears. So, and you can put tons of moisturizers on your face your stratum corneum, which is a top layer of your skin, ensures that none of this is being absorbed or maybe 5% of it being absorbed because you're, these products just find it very difficult to penetrate the stratum corneum or to get into the dermis or epidermis where you want. So there's an injection called the skin booster into the subdermal area. So I get it out the way now. Uh, so hyaluronic acid appears in many parts of the body, in our joint, skin, bones, etc., uh, uh, skin and and joints and, and the collagen and so on. So it appears everywhere. But when we inject hyaluronic acid uh, of these fillers, you've got to have, you can see this particular brand's got how many types of products here. It's got to do with the particle size. We call it rheology. It's got to do with the particle size, how elastic it is. Uh, for example, if it's a nose and a chin, we want it to stick out. We want it to be very high viscosity. We don't want to press and it disappears. For the tear trough and the lips, we want it to be a very soft area. Say we just want to build volumization. We want it very soft. But there are some people who want it to be uh, to look like a uh, I wouldn't say a duck or, or sausage roll. They they want it so exaggerated. That you use a heavier material, so it's not so soft. So there is a technicality and there's an art to what you're trying to use. So most of these absorb get absorbed between nine months and two years. Uh, the the most part of it is at the highly mobile area, like the lips, it's very highly mobile. So, and you've got to use a soft material. So you don't expect it to like last nine months. You start disappearing from about four or five months, depending on the product that you use, and then gradually gets absorbed. They all get absorbed totally. Uh, how often? Well, there's been a study in there and doing an MRI, they say, look, it lasts one, two years. It all depends on the depth and where you put them. Uh, but we don't use an MRI or CT scan to say, do we inject now? Is it more there? We don't do that. We just look for the aesthetic. That gives us a guide. People don't look. We don't treat the test. We treat the patient. So in terms of aesthetics, we need to say, have we done enough? But in general, um, lower part of the face is where you are, uh, is more noticeable. Uh, that's where the aging process is. Uh, happens a lot. You know the skeletal thing. Um, so most of it is by absorbed by nine months to two years. Sometimes they do last long, especially seven months. So why do we inject? We know that with aging, there are changes to the bones, the skin, the muscles, and the ligaments. But what concerns us in terms of volumization is actually the bone structure. It's actually the lower part of the face more than the upper part. Uh, because the upper part, there's not much you can inject. It's just a temple in the forehead. Uh, not many people need the forehead injected. Uh, neither is the temple. So a lot of it is a lower part of the face. That's where, where all the, all the uh, cosmetic clinics you see a lot uh, in the shopping area, that's where it's all injected in the lips area. So of course in the lips, there are changes, structural changes. Well, there's no bone there, but all along this, you dentists know better than me, is a lot of significant uh, dentition changes and the bone resorption changes. 
And of course, we lose HA and collagen as we age. Now, why do I bring up collagen again? Because remember, I said the third category here was a collagen stimulation fillers. So that is, that's been around for 30, 40 years. So uh, we don't need to talk about that yet. We just talk about the HA fillers, mainly for volumization. So in this lady, um, in this lady, uh, she, like I mentioned already, she, her, her tear troughs got better, those fine wrinkles there, the skin laxities got better because it's got volume, the nasal labial fold's got volume, and with the cheeks that pulls up the nasal labial fold, and then the marionette area is improved, and the cheek overall is just volumized. Uh, that's what we've done. Um, Dr. Tanya will address the scope of the dentist. Um, what is relevant to the dental facial aesthetics? You can't, you, can't, um, you know, there's more than teeth. Uh, well, the teeth is what you see on the inside, but uh, I see the things on the outside. So what is zoom in is that for the dentist will be the lips, the nasal labial fold, the marionette lines, the perioral. Perioral means like even the smoker's line, that's a whole area, the perioral, because uh, they, they both collapse as they get older. And the preauricular, which is a jawbone, uh, preauricular area, the jaw area, uh, angle of the jaw and the jawline and the chin. So basically this is where uh, is so close to where you guys treat uh, all these areas is what you look at every day in terms of cosmetic or aesthetic dentistry. As no guess, by far, the biggest demand is lip uh, fillers. Uh, in any cosmetic laser clinic, that is number one. Okay, if you are in Asia, it may be very different. Uh, most Asians uh, don't need lips, the darker the skin. Uh, when we are, where we are um, skin type one or two, which is the uh, hairy skin, you have, tend to have a thin uh, upper lip and then a thicker lower lip. And when we are Asians, we're sort of half there, it's almost ratio is one to one. And in the uh, US American, uh, African Americans, so they usually have a thicker upper lip and a low, thinner lower lip. So the proportion, um, if we're dealing with these many Caucasians here, uh, we, so we maintain the ratio. And what do they want as they get older is that they need, they want volumization, right? They want it to be nicer. But in this case, in this Asian girl, she really got nice plum lips, but they want an exaggeration. So you need a, what we call a lip enhancement. So it's beyond volumization. They just want it to be uh, slightly bigger. So look, that is a trend. I'm not saying whether it's right or wrong. Uh, we follow the aesthetic trend and some of them want weird looking lips, uh, but that's what they want. Of course, when we teach you, we teach you how to create those weird looking lips. Not that you should do them, but it's part of learning how, how it happened. But that is a demand. As long as you're safe, it's not a problem. Um, some people want to have green dyed hair. You, you learn how to do it. Whether you want to do it is your choice. So lip filler is every day what you guys look at. But in terms of learning, uh, what is there to learn about the lips? Well, there is a lot. It's not just the lips and the cheeks. So we just talk about filler in general. There are four things that we need to focus on. First of all, injections has to go somewhere in the face. The face anatomy, as you know, is different from my forearm or my, uh, or my torso. It requires a study of anatomy. So it requires to know to identify the danger zone, well, of course, you know for facial artery where it runs, but that may not be relevant. You actually need to know the plane where it goes in, uh, how it goes in, um, you know, into the right plane. And then, of course, there's a skill of learning whether you use a cannula or a needle. And of course, you need to know to recognize when you have blocked an artery and how to reverse it. And this is a big take on mine, is for you to learn the reversal protocol, you know how to reverse it. And then that's not a problem. And if you follow my Facebook recently, um, two, three months ago, I featured a lady who had her lips injected. I didn't believe that you could, in, you could actually block a facial artery from injecting a lip, uh, but the, the nurse disappeared and she insisted that she injected the lip. Um, usually we just block the superior labial artery and not the facial artery. Um, but how it got back to the facial artery, I don't know. And the lady was injected on a Friday and contacted the clinic on Saturday and say it was bruising. Sunday, she got worse. She went to casualty. They didn't know what to do. And uh, 
And then uh, she would live five hours away. And then on Monday, she went to see GP, didn't know what to do. And, uh, and then she was referred to me on the Tuesday evening. I saw her Wednesday. Now, uh, this is the right-hand side, lower bottom picture. She's number three, 48 hours later. It was far too late. The recognition was far too late. The skin becomes locked there, uh, uh, necrotic and it was far too late. But anyway, I did reverse her. Uh, the process was follow up uh, almost day by day at the uh, face by Facebook of teaching, use it as a teaching. Uh, we were very grateful to her. Uh, no one in the world has collected a serial picture of day one to five, the skin breaking down. I mean, most of it will have been treated already, right? So you don't have to see a serial picture of her five, the first five days. And, and lucky for me, uh, for us, we got her photos, not lucky for her because she presented too late and she kept a serial photograph. Um, she, it was a bruising and the clinic didn't know what to do and say, told her it was bruising and nobody knew what to do until they, she found me. Uh, some of the doctor referred to me. Okay, apart from that. So what is the dental advantage? This is why I'm, I'm passionate about this area because, and this is also an area that the dentist may not know. So you're already working very close to the lips, right? So you're already in that area, but now people are just coming out one lips done. And if not, they will Google, um, they will Google which dentist uh, perform lip fillers. You know why? If you look at number five down below, because you guys uh, can perform dental blocks that I can't, I still can't master my dental block. And uh, they may want a painless lip injection. We can't do that, I must say, uh, you know? So we, because we don't know how to do dental blocks and, and I, I'm still not proficient at it. I have to admit that lack of practice, lack of, I don't know, that it's just not me to do a dental block. And uh, when it came to that emergency, uh, that lady had necrosis there in five days and somebody said, uh, it was so painful for me to inject her. We we videoed the whole thing. We took an hour to reverse the to reverse the blockage. And somebody said, "Oh Ben, did you think about doing a dental block?" I said, "Oh man, I should have thought about it. I forgot how to do a dental block, and uh, I didn't know I should have done the dental block so to put her so that she didn't have to be so painful when I uh, injected her with hyaluronidase." Um, so that is your second advantage. And injecting the masseter is as medical as or dental as aesthetics. So there is a function there uh, to stop people grinding the teeth, right? And I'm, I'm a teeth grinder, like I said, um, you know, so this is um, not recognized widely because we don't look into that area. And you guys, other than you guys, who's going to look at grinding teeth, right? If it's not dentists, no one else is doing the grinding teeth. No one. Uh, doctors don't check the grinding teeth is not our area so there's an there's a window here of teeth grinders that we all miss uh, because that is not in our area and the dentist of course you have a head start on facial anatomy focusing that area i can tell you uh, none of us <laughs> studied facial anatomy uh, it is so complex uh, but we knew very little about it uh, of course when you study we can be brought up to speed and the thing is that your environment is conducive to clinical procedures. Don't forget, lip injections, cheek injection, nasal liability, these are clinical procedures. They are not just cosmetic. And that is a big argument whether they should be performed in a, in a shopping center. I leave that argument to the politicians and the lobbyists. But you guys have a, an environment, just like doctors do, uh, more conducive uh, conducive to clinical procedures. We are clinicians, we are scientists. So we are not just injecting something uh, just out of the blue. So we do have a duty of patient care uh, in here. So where to from now if you want to be trained? I'm not selling Aesthetic Skin Institute, but we are ECRAM, which is Rural Australia uh, accredited. So we are recognized and our online emergency and uh, anatomy is CBD, UK CBD accredited. And we are just about to get our USA CME accredited. So our trainers have at least 10 years of, uh, well, 10 years of experience and who run and own successful cosmetic clinics. And we have a dentist cleaner for dentists as well, in case you think, uh, okay, we, <laughs> uh, we are here to guide you as doctors, but uh, I wrote the anatomy and, and all the training modules, but it will be nice to have someone who can talk to you direct as a dentist trainer. I can't thank her enough because you can talk the same language as you guys can. Um, 
I can't teach you dental block number one. So that's my problem. And the thing is that if it's good to be trained by doctors associated with us, because if you do have a complication, you are medically supported because we are used to injecting Harleys and deal with skin complications. We are used to doing that. So we're here to support you uh, if, and if there is an event of complication. We hope not, but you might just need us one day. And we are, we are a group of doctors who can uh, smooth out the problem and just solve the problem for you rather than uh, it's not likely that you're going to talk to another dentist about skin or or whatever problem is not likely to be talking to a medical. So we are here to support you. And our courses are most comprehensive, which I'll get into it later. We move, we treat from skin to injections from beginners to advanced. And our resources, we constantly update. As you can see, we constantly update our journals and so on. So although you are trained by dentists, you are supported by us. So, I'm very proud to announce, actually, this is a program, it's, not to, it's nothing new. We train people in a stepwise and a progressive learning manner. Why, why is that important? We start with the cheeks and the lips and gradually advance to cannula, gradually advance to the more complicated, uh, the jaw, so you're used to getting the cannula, the feel of the cannula, then the chin, and then move on to the more complicated areas like the nasolabial fold, we do it step by step. There's no such thing. Gone, when we first learned about 15, 20 years ago, we, the, one of the areas was injecting the nasolabial foam. Oh my God. When we look back, nasolabial foam area is one of the highest complications of skin necrosis. And in fact, it can also cause blindness if you are not careful. So, but that's how we started. Nobody talked about anatomy, but we are different. We need you to know anatomy and we need you to inject under supervision in a clinical manner, not in a hotel room. Uh, we need to be, uh, we are clinicians. They, basically, we, we treat this seriously. So why do it? I'll leave Tanya to uh, expand on it. The market is definitely growing. Uh, for me, it's a passion to learn, uh, a passion to teach, and to those who want to learn. Initially, it is skill. It is to do with where you stick the needle, where you stick the cannula and what depth you stick it. And later on, it is really artistic. And I bet it's part of it is dentistry too. It's artistic, it's like orthodontist, right? It becomes, uh, no single patient is the same. It becomes an artistic, how do you make it better? And how do you, how do you read beauty or aesthetics into it? Um, look, I've done, I've taught so many doctors, nurses and et cetera. Uh, it's time that I pass on my skill and my experience and to you is a new scope, is a new skill. Uh, the main thing is that nowadays, uh, well, because of ASI, you can actually learn safely. Uh, this is available. You, we need you to be safe. Um, not, not the training is done in the past, not that we see, and you don't know where you get the training on. There is a progression, there's a stepwise, and there's a, and a support and mentoring process. So we don't want you, want to, want you to le le learn lips one day and next minute you jump to nasal labial fold when you don't have enough experience. You scare the hell out of me if you do that because that is, you haven't built enough experience, you haven't built enough uh, experience yet to progress to the next area. So it is very important for me to emphasize that one must learn safely. And as a trainer, safety is number one because you, when you are injecting, I am actually there uh, watching you. So um, any questions so far? Oh, excellent presentation, Dr. Ben Chan. I really, I'm just so happy. I've learned so much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure everyone agrees. Okay, so some more messages. Uh, ben, you have my name wrong again, Tanya. <laughs> huh? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if she's making a joke. Matthew, are these programs recognized in Australia? Um, and then we're going to talk about the dentistry because there's still some questions about scope, insurance. I kind of have answered, but I think Dr. Tanya should come now to answer some of them as uh, she's a dentist, right? Practicing in Melbourne. Sure. She can, you want to put her on now? Yeah, she's well, she should be able to go on herself. <laughs> Hi, know? everyone. Can you guys hear me? Yes, yes, can hear you. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, Ben, for that wonderful presentation. Look, I know it's getting late. I'll sort of, I'll, I'll just go through this very quick and I'll go through some 
um, some more interesting stuff. So um, yeah, everyone's been asking, so can dentists do this? Well, firstly, I just want to talk about what is aesthetic dentistry. So Mosby's Dental Dictionary defines aesthetic dentistry as the skills and techniques used to improve the art and the symmetry of teeth and face to enhance the appearance as well as function. So really, we are improving the patient's health and function, but at the same time, we're also improving their aesthetics on a daily basis. So if you're a dentist doing veneers, you can definitely do this sort of stuff. So when we are assessing patients for the first general or orthodontic examination, we're constantly looking for symmetry and things like proportions, the vertical, horizontal, and you know, Rickett's E-line. You're familiar with this sort of stuff. Um, orthodontically, we can improve a lot of these areas, but sometimes there might be just small little changes that we can do with Botox and fillers, such as you know, gummy smile, to improve the overall aesthetics of the patient. And I'll go through a couple of cases later. Now, scope of practice. So look, um, straight from the dental board's definition of dentist scope of practice. Dentistry, I'm just, I'm just reading this off the website now. Dentistry involves assessing, preventing, diagnosing, advising, and treating any injuries, diseases, deficiencies, deformities, or lesions on or of the human teeth, mouth, or jaws associated structures. So associated structures. There's actually a page and um, we can provide the link uh, later on in the slides about, there's a whole page on the dental board's comments on dentists doing Botox and dermal fillers. But in conclusion, the answer is yes, we can do it. It's within our scope of practice. And um, obviously, there's a catch. You have to be competent and have up-to-date knowledge and training to do this. And you also need insurance. And of course, you need good notes. So, you know, dental board's always going on and on about notes. So you need to uh, record and document. Thank you, Dr. Tanner. Are you able to paste that link on the chat here? If you have, otherwise send it to me later. Absolutely, yep. Yeah. Um, now, Ben, can you can you quickly just answer because because uh, Matthew's got a really good question. Are these programs recognised in Australia? Can you answer Hello. that one, please? Uh, yeah, I was going to address that. Okay, we are recognised by ECRAM, which is uh, Australian. I can't even remember what it is. You know, there's a RACGP and there's a and the rural is called ECRAM. RACGP no longer accredits such courses. And ECRAM is the equivalent of RACGP except the rural. So we got that accreditation. Are they recognized? Okay. When you go to, if the, you go to APRA and, and they say, what have you done? Definitely they look at training and they look at education. If you get a, if you get a company to come out and train you, that is training, but that's not education. But if you look at our website, we have CBD points that's accredited by UK and soon to be like USD, uh, USA, like I mentioned. So yes, that is education. So there are CBD points as well. So if you are being trained by us, can we train to you by to show your competency? No, no certification, no everywhere in the world will show you a certificate of competency, especially not being trained over a weekend. But our program is different from uh, all the rest trainers. Uh, we are make sure that if you are still not, if you are not competent enough, we would like you to come back and you can attend the next workshop and inject, or you can bring clients back to us. We have Melbourne, Sydney, whatever, Melbourne, Sydney, Perth. We like to watch you to inject under our supervision until you feel comfortable, you are okay to inject on your own. But we, we will, uh, because we are also applying RTO process in the, uh, in the meantime. So during the training workshop, we will be assessing you to say which areas you are competent in, which areas you are not. But uh, we have failed one person so far, uh, you know, because we just deem her incompetent. Even after that, we just say, sorry, we can't even give you a certificate because uh, you are nowhere near that yet. So... Uh, in terms of recognition, well, we're recognizing as that's as far as you get to, we're recognized by ACAM in Australia. And yeah. 
I was just discussing with Dr. Ben Chan because we're an accredited training organization in Australia and he could actually host his courses with us. So we kind of just had a quick chat about that. But, you know, um, Australian accreditation is all forever going. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's almost ridiculous. It stops education here. Um, let's look at one. Can I just quickly say that that is definitely not a, uh, not a, uh, issue with the insurance, they will insure you because I've spoken to two uh, dental insurances. That's not a problem. So is it as long extra as you got premium, Doctor Ben, is it extra premium? Uh, Tanya, Tanya, you can. Uh, yes, yeah. So look, correct. It is extra premium because just like everything else that you add to your uh, insurance, such as you know refund of fees or whatever, it's mm -hmm. just an extra addition. Okay, and so there's a question here which I think is very very relevant. And uh, how can dentists diagnose the need for patients for fillers and Botox and talk to the patient about it? So introducing okay. it, picking it up. Yep, I'll, I'll answer that one. So look, um, I can go on and on and, and teach that, uh, you know, teach that topic. But um, I just want to quickly talk about two case studies and that sort of can demonstrate how we can, um, you know, get patient to introduce cosmetics to patients without really telling them that they need it so um for example if we're talking about uh masters before um, i once had a patient who was a very severe grinder and she used to go through an occlusal splint every uh six seven months and she'd wake up with headaches almost every morning so if i didn't know how to do this all i could do was to keep on making her new splints but with this extra skill that i have um i could see that she had huge masseter and temporalis muscles and it was literally the size of a tennis ball. And each time she was clinching, it popped out of her face. So I can see that with a bit of Botox, that would benefit her. So while we took impressions for a new splint, at the same appointment, we injected Botox in um, both areas. And when she returned two weeks later to have the new splint put in, the tennis balls turned into golf balls. So they were a lot smaller. And patient reported that even without the splint, she was... She didn't have the splint for two, um, two weeks, but her headaches were actually getting better because the result of having smaller muscles, she didn't grind as hard. So since then, we hadn't really had to make her any new splints. She just came in every eight or 10 months to have the Botox touched up. So, you know, situations like that, you can just offer the patient more treatment. You know, I, I feel like um, I can definitely offer them more because with that knowledge that I have, there's more treatment options. Mm -hmm. um, can we go through that case study, Ben, of that patient? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So if we look at, can you zoom up on the on the picture a little bit more or, or not? Yeah. yeah, we can, bit... yeah. Okay, no worries. Um, so look, this is uh, Rosa, she's 67 years old. She came to me for veneers. So she had her daughter's wedding in a few months time. Now my clinic's a little bit different. I have a medical dental and skin clinic. So, you know, we've got posters all over the wall and we'll talk about it at our courses of how you can introduce this to your patients, to your existing patients. And um, now, obviously we never tell patients, oh, Mrs. Smith, you need fillers, you need Botox. That's not the right way of doing it. As Ben said, you can really offend people, but the best way is to get the patient to ask you so seeing all our posters in the waiting room and seeing pictures as well um, in our treatment room uh, she asked about what we can do for her so after doing veneers now I won't show you the before and after for veneers because we all know how to do that um, but you can see we haven't really made her look that different I, I can't say so you know top one is before bottom one is after I can't say that I've made her look 10 years younger but what we've done is we've made her look less tired. So, you know, after the veneers, she still looks tired. So what we've done here, we've started off with skincare. Um, then we did some Botox and finally finished with fillers. Um, filler areas we did were under eye, lips, nasal labial, uh, cheeks, marionette and chin. So you can see that was a lot of areas we've done but we actually didn't put too much in each of the areas. Uh, now, in this case, I've got to admit, I've also put in a couple of threads as well to give a little bit of lift in her eyes. 
so she could open them up a bit more. So you can see when we um, treat the patient's mouth and teeth, we can also do so much more. I mean, what about the 90% of the patient's face? You can do so much more for that patient. Yeah. Does that sort of answer your, your question? So, you know, th there's many ways of advertising, but not obvious advertising, put it that way. <laughs> so, um, I mean, at the courses, we'll teach you how to write notes. We'll um, show you what insurance companies that you can go with and um, really important uh, records. And yeah, all, all, the, all these things will, will guide you through. And are there uh, courses in Sydney as well? I mean, with COVID travel, what's happening with all of that? We should be running in Sydney as well. And uh, yeah. yeah, okay. Um, we have a, uh, you know, by the way, people are saying excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, I actually have a question before I go to this one. Sleep apnea, snoring. Um, are there any evidence linking uh, Botox for any kind of relief or is a, a positive effect as a therapy? No, sleep apnea, no. The closest, the newest one was a laser to the, uh, fer uh, to the pharynx. So that was the, that's the latest. You would think muscles relaxing might actually make it a little bit better, but- That'd make it worse. <laughs> it could, it could, because if your tongue drops down in the airway space when you're supine, then yes. But it's just interesting thought. I wanted to know whether there is, so you, so is there any evidence to say it could be worse though? Is there any indication? No, no, no? we checked so that. No, no effect, basically. No, not yeah. sleep apnea. Okay, and, and not, not with fillers either, nothing to do with that. No. Okay, perfect. Um, now we have a question, I think last questions, because it's been great. Uh, Marina, your question was answered by Dr. Lee. Um, okay, so Marina, okay, we've got more questions, okay. Um, would you, who you recommend for PI? And yeah, who do you recommend for PI? What Thank do you mean about PI, Matthew? And then, uh, I thought he meant indemnity insurance, but actually that's uh, probably not PI. Okay. <laughs> Marina is asking a question. What new generation of materials would you recommend for lip and cheek fillers? Dentists are very involved in new materials. Um, look, the question and empty, yeah. Uh, you can answer that. <laughs> yeah. The dental material. Yeah, the, the, the dentists are very involved in new materials. So what are the new materials for lip and cheek? Uh, no, ben, not, ben, not dental material. We're talking about filler material. Oh, can no. We, so can it, we talk about this in chat? <laughs> uh, no, no, nothing much new. They just try to rebrand everything and... There's a bit slight subtle difference between uh, just one, like how much HA in one mil, and then they change it, and then they call it, uh, they just call it a different brand. Look, there are so many options out there. So in terms of technology, it's still the HA uh, particle. It's just how many how many HA particles in the gram of, of that substance. That's all, nothing much new. It's just fantastic. By the way, um, this QR code, where does that lead? Uh, lead us lead you to either our courses or Facebook or whatever. Oh, um, great. Actually, I, I've somehow lost this full screen. I have one more slide to share. Yeah, just press it and press, you know, the play on the top. So if you press uh, play, play, yeah, there's a play button. Play. On your uh, top, yeah, next to table. Yeah, that's it. If you press play there, you should uh, play it. Video. So I've just done a poll asking people to rate. Ben, you're getting excellence, 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 and a lot of value for this lecture. Thank you so much. But you know, right. I've just Any launched a poll. Guys, just answer this poll, please. Uh, very helpful for presenters as well. And just to know, you know, what they're touching base on is valuable to you. Thank you. Can you see my last slide? Can you see my last slide? Yeah, yeah. Can you, you can see half a slide beyond yeah, dentistry. Beyond dentistry, yes. Okay, you want me to continue? This is the last slide. Yes, continue, please. Okay, Tanya did mention about having a skin clinic. Let me tell you, anybody out there, whether it's your brother, sister, mother, can go and run a skin clinic. 
So you don't have to be a dentist, doctors or nurses to run a skin clinic. So we, what does that mean? So we have actually a course, a four and a half day course of run, running a skin clinic. Look, I've seen many courses out there. They are, you know, one thing they'll learn PRP, one thing you learn about micro needle. Um, there is nothing anybody can learn that it doesn't have to be any specific group. But as long as you're performing that, uh, that function, then you may not call yourself dentist or something. So you have to wear slightly different hat. And I have seen uh, the last point, a few dentists already set up cosmetic skin clinic. Nothing to stop anyone from running a cosmetic skin clinic. But this program is designed for someone who say, okay, I've got a dental room. I want the skin therapist to work in there. So why is this skin important? Because when I, when I first started teaching, don't you remember I run a few cosmetic clinics. I own a few cosmetic clinics. I get people very confused. The first thing to go and buy is a laser. My goodness, the laser is something that you should not touch um, for many reasons. Number one, it is, uh, it is a very super specialized machine for specific conditions. And secondly, um, it's a very expensive piece of equipment when to set up when you find that most of your clients don't actually need lasers. So I wrote this program and it's a four and a half day program. The first two days is knuckling down to the basics, right? You of course have to learn the, about the skin science. Nobody is born with the knowledge uh, of epidermis and dermis, right? No one, not even doctors. We only know approximately dermis and uh, epidermis. But when it comes to aesthetic treatment, we are different because we then need to know uh, what are we targeting? So a skin is, is, if you break it down to skin science, that's the first two day of program. It's not com that complicated. You are dealing with a stratum cornea, which why? Because microdermabrasion straps it off so that you can get ingredients in there. And, and then of course you did the melanocyte, why? Because these are the ones who are causing all the dyschromia or the pigmentation. And then you will deal with the fibroblast uh, in the dermis, why? Because they're the ones who produce your collagen, your elastin. So it is actually scientific based. So the first two days about skin care, about skin peel, uh, you know, why you use certain ingredients. So it's very basic to a sparish thing, uh, skin peel, micro needling. So there's a science behind it. We don't just go and buy skin care for the sake of say, oh, vitamin C or it gets so confused out there. So then for those who want to invest in a bit more in, um, how shall I say, more advanced skincare, a bit more, uh, then we introduce, starting introduce IPO and micro needle RF. Why do we introduce these two equipment? That's the next two days. So that's day three and four. Because you understand if you run a skin clinic, what are your main people, uh, clientele? Your main clientele are those people who want to have skin rejuvenation or acne or pores. That's about it. You know, those are anti-aging. You leave the melasma, you leave the acne scar, to specialized modules, which we also teach. The reason is, and that's why you don't go and buy a laser to start learning about treating melasma when it's such a complicated process, it's a medical treatment. So the first two days is about sparish, about skin care and so on. And then the next two days about what equipment to buy, it's just RPL and uh, IPL and micro needle RF. And then the third, the fifth day, we take you uh, how to incorporate in clinic and, and the home treatment together so that you design a package that is suitable for your clinic. Can dentists run that? Well, I wouldn't say dentists, but can a dental clinic run that? Of course, you know, because if you have the room, you have a captured audience, uh, you can, that is why I say it's beyond dentistry and is this a course um, that is geared towards practice owners, practice managers, or, uh, dentists, or anyone who wants to get into this extent, they are uh, beyond the dentistry clinic, but it is called a skin clinic. So that's a program that is worth attending. It doesn't matter whether you are, a, you know, you, you're already in skin clinic. There has to be some science behind what you're doing. So it gives you more confidence and not just trying to sell products. Okay, thank you. So any, um, oh, this is your final slide, yeah? Yeah. yeah. So okay. here's a question time. Okay. Any more questions, guys? I think we've heard a lot of questions. There's been very interesting questions from everyone. Um, people are voting in the poll. Any other questions, guys, that are, remain unanswered for you at this stage? Actually, I have a question. Um, how do you compare, and I know this is hard, 
because if someone asks me, how do you compare against other courses? I'll say, of course, I mean, I'm the designer boss, I'm biased. And I would always say it is one of the most innovative courses. How do you compare to some of the other courses out there? From all I know is there's very few out there that talk about this and many of them are very short. Um, what is the difference then when I, I'm coming to you to learn this? Look, I think that the, these two slides, the previous two slides, uh, yeah. explain it all. Yeah. Um, because we are, we honestly, um, when we started with this project, we needed to be global leaders. And I wanted to make, make Australia proud. And our online course um, is, uh, from my own, from my own um, assessment, it, we have to be the world's best because it's online. Uh, we sell it. So we, we are that up to that degree of being the one of the best or if not the best, we have to be, we are judged by everyone in the world. So we, we set ourselves a very high standard. So we review literature, we, we upgrade our program. That's why it's recognized in so many places and within our own shores. And we have training in all, all the capital cities. But um, having said that, look, I'm not sure about that many people who train dentists there are, but don't forget, we are here to support you in case complications and we are very scientific based. Okay, if you look at our website and the CBD points will just tell you the caliber of knowledge and the training that we go through to make sure number one is that you are safe. I don't care about how good our trainers are because then all our trainers already have years of experience and we get a feedback from you guys whether our trainer is good. You can Google our trainers they are actually top trainers as well. So they are well known in the industry. So you wouldn't want to come to us and we get you someone who is not recognized. So um, they are happy to be associated with us and we are happy to be associated with them because our credibility is important, but nothing beats the support that we give you, whether it's in times of we, we can get you people who have done our courses, either in terms of our support, we just don't believe in the weekend, two day work, uh, two day training, and off you go on your own. You are constantly in touch with the trainers. So it's not that you are, we hide under the banner. No, you don't. We are constantly in touch. We have a team of people who answer telephone. And like I say, we patient safety is our main concern. That's excellent. Can I, can I, sorry, Ben, can I just quickly add to that? So I think one of the big differences is a lot of courses, you've got either doctors training dentists or you've got dentists training dentists, but uh, we're actually a group of doctors and dentists training everyone. So um, you'll definitely have that whole group of support behind you. If you ever run into any problems with um, your insurance or uh, patients or, you know, hopefully ever never with the dental board, you've got support by us. Yeah. Well, thank you, Tijana, saying thank you. Great presentation. Um, and uh, you should run training courses in Brisbane. She's from Brisbane, obviously. Um, you know, uh, Ben, I'm so inspired by you because that's really what BOSS is about. I say it's not about teaching you the most advanced cases, it's about keeping you safe, keeping our patients happy, getting predictable, uh, excellent treatments, uh, knowing our limits. That's what it's all about. And that's why I love teaching. So you're very similar to me. So I'm really inspired. And I really thank you and Tanya for your time. The preparation that goes behind this, the handouts you shared with us, the video that you're sharing with us after this webinar. I really appreciate it. This is just phenomenal. Thank you. And I'm sure the students are appreciating it too. And you know, some of them are already doing it. So they had answer the questions and um, it answered a lot for me too even though I don't do it. Good, I'm glad it's useful to someone. <laughs> yeah, so 